Psalm 20. Somebody say, hurry up, Pastor. Hurry up. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Be kind. You, you weren't really supposed to say that. Okay. All right, so I'll, I'll, let's read uh, responsively, concluding together at verse 9. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice, Selah. We will rejoice in thy salvation and in the name of our God we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Together, save Lord, let the king. Okay, you may be seated. Okay, all right, so it's. Uh, It's worship at its best. It's Psalm 20. And we want to deal with it a little bit. And um, we want to deal with it. This way. The setting of the psalm. The structure of the psalm. And the supplication of the psalm. Setting of the psalm. Structure of the psalm and the supplication of the psalm. Now, since last year, we've been dealing with the subject worship as a lifestyle. That's been the primary focus that we've been dealing with. And um, I'm hoping that you will grab a hold of, what, of, what, of what's going on. Um, I've been asking you and encouraging you congregationally to start reading the psalms daily, five psalms a day. And I need you to understand that that's not simply a religious exercise that we're after. We're not simply saying do this as a religious exercise. The Word of God is powerful and it has the ability to transform the life. Let me give you two verses that you want to keep close to your heart. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Please go there. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Go there. Very important. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 and 2. If you have it, would you say amen? Everyone that has it, say amen. All right? Together. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the that you hold it. Present your what? Money. Present your money. present your money. Present your offerings. 
present your bodies, what? Go. Which is your... Now, understand this. Understand this. That when he talks about presenting your bodies, the issue is this. Once God has our bodies, he has everything else that's connected to it. So in this verse, he doesn't ask for money. He doesn't ask for career. He doesn't ask for mind. He doesn't ask for heart. The assumption is that once you present your body, everything that's attached to it comes with it. That you present your bodies a living what? Sacrifice. Now watch. He then closes the verse by saying, it is your reasonable service. Do you know what the literal translation of that clause is? It is, it is your intelligent act of worship. That's the literal translation of the last clause. That when you present your body as a living sacrifice, it is in fact your, watch, intelligent act of worship. Remember, the Apostle Paul says this. He begins the verse by saying, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Well, what are the mercies of God? The mercies of God in this context are the first 11 chapters. Therefore, literally, to understand the therefore of verse 1 of chapter 12, you've got to go all the way back and read from chapter 1 to chapter 11 because all of that are the multiplied mercies of God. That's the reason why in verse 1 he doesn't say, I beseech you therefore by the mercy of God, singular. It's plural, the mercies of God. That's literal. So he says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Why? Because th that is your intelligent act of worship, meaning that you've thought about what God has done and you conclude that the very least I can do for him is give him my body. That is your intelligent act of worship. Verse 2. Together. And be not conformed, but be ye by the... Come on, that you may. What is that? Watch this. And be not conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed how? By the renewing of your, your mind. There's only one resource that we have that has the ability to renew the mind. And that's the Word of God. How do we know that? Glad you asked. Hebrews chapter 4. Mark these verses down, please. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. If you have it, would you say amen? amen. All right, everybody together, go. It's quick and Do you see that? Check this. The reason why we want to encourage you to have a daily time of reading the Word, and in, 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 in context of what we're doing here at the church, particularly the Psalms, in this juncture in our journey together, is because God's Word has the ability to transform you. It transforms us by getting into us and dealing with us based on what God knows about us. Here it is. The Word of God is quick and powerful. Here it is. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Check it. Piercing even unto what? The dividing asunder of what? what that means the Word of God gets you further than, it goes further than, it gets deeper than the body. That's where you present your body to him, 
But once you've done that, the word of God gets a hold of you on the inside, the inner reaches of our hearts and our lives. In other words, there's absolutely nothing that you and I can do to get away from the truth of God's word. Why? Because God's word has the ability to discern. Watch. Not only the thoughts, that is, you know, things that we think, but also the intents, the purposes. In other words, what you have in mind for your next action. Not simply what you're going to do, but why you're going to do it. God's word has the ability to search that out and seek that out. And the implication of the passage is to correct whatever needs to be corrected in the heart and in the mind. It changes us. That's the reason why, um, um, you know, sometimes you come in church and you sit there and you say to yourself, how in the world did this man or this person who's teaching or preaching, whatever, how, can, how, how in the world do they know? How do you know? How, how could you tell that? How do you know that? How come you calling me out? How come you how come he talking about me today? Ain't got no preaching on nothing. I, I tell you right now, I tr trust me when I tell you, I do not have time to follow you all around to figure out what's going on in your life so I can bring it up here in the pulpit on Sunday morning. That's not the issue. So that if there's any finding, if there's anything you, you, you conclude, you say, I, he found me today. No, I didn't find you. Don't do that. It wasn't me. I'm not that smart, nor am I that interested. Amen. Praise Jesus. But there is a God in heaven that loves us all, that specializes in finding us right where we are in the moments we're there because he wants to, watch, encourage us in the areas where we need to be encouraged and then correct us in the areas where we need to be corrected. And all of us got some areas that need to be corrected. From the pulpit to the door. Amen? Amen? All right, so the issue concerning the reading of the Psalms. The, the goal of the Psalm, the whole purpose of the Psalms is worship. That's right. Everything in the Psalms is about worship. To one degree, in one form or another, everything in here from Psalm 1 to Psalm 150, all of it involves worship. Now, Paul says that when we present our bodies to God, it is an intelligent act of worship. You got it? Now, when we do that, we're literally becoming worshipers the way the Psalms outline the idea of worship. Not Sunday morning. There are situations and there are circumstances in your lives, in mine, that only show up after church. When the door is closed and the choir has stopped singing and the mics are off and the preacher is gone and everybody has left, there are some issues that come up that only show up in your life and mine after church. When those things come up, the Psalms say you worship. Why? Because worship can be an adequate weapon against the enemy. There are some things that Satan can't handle. And he's not afraid of any of us. But there is something about worship that changes the whole dynamics of the situation. Check this out. This thing is so serious that in the Old Testament, when Israel would go out to fight, when they were walking in favor with God, and they weren't going out doing their own thing, here's what the Lord told them to do. He says, get ready for the battle, line up the battle, hear what you do, send the singers out first. Before, before the swordsmen and the arrows and the spears and all that stuff run out, before you do any of that, here's what you do. Take, take the choir members, all of the song leaders, and put them out first. 
Yeah, and then hear what you do. Have them sing psalms. Have them lift up my name. Right? Have them praise me. Right? And then go and do your thing. Because what you're going to find out is, is that it is in the midst of the worship that the battle is won. Now I know you. I know and some. You know some of you will argue and say, "Well, rest, rest, that's wonderful for the for the Old Testament." Yeah, yeah, okay, you could say that if you want to do that, but then you're gonna have a problem with Ephesians five, where the Apostle Paul says that we are to encourage one another and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Hold it, and he says that in chapter five. Watch this, in preparation, that builds momentum for chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Here it is, put on the whole armor. So watch this, so that literally you go from worship to war. So please don't argue with me about, oh, you don't know them people. No, I don't, I don't know them people, but I know the Lord. And I know what he planned. I know that his strategy for winning battles is a whole lot different than ours. When we get out there, we embarrass ourselves and look terrible. And if you're not careful, get whooped. Amen. Come on here, y'all ain't. Yeah, I know y'all bad. I know you're bad. I know you're bad. But get whooped. Yeah, but when you put him out there first and let him do the work, you'd be surprised. God will make your enemies bless you. Watch this. He'll make them bless you. They'll have to watch themselves bless you. They won't be able to understand why they're blessing you. They wish that they didn't, but they don't have no help whatsoever but to do what the Lord says because the Lord is on your side. I'm telling you what I know. I'm telling you what I know. All right? So it's worship. This 20th Psalm is, is literally helpful in this particular dynamic because the setting of this psalm, Point one, the setting of the song is a battle. This issue is so critical that um, some Old Testament scholars argue that Psalm 20 and 21 were written at the same time by the same person, pardon me, surrounding the same event. So that Psalm 20 is written before the fight. Psalm 21, which we'll look at next time, is written after the fight. So the idea is, is that there is this, um, there is this, um, there's this battle, this fight, this, this war that's about to take place. Something's getting ready to happen on the other side of the psalm. And the psalmist, <clears throat> identifying the moment that they're in, literally begins to lay out their heart's desire before they go to war. Now, of course, if this is true, and, we, and, and, and Old Testament scholars tell us that it is, and I, and I, I kind of lean toward that. If it is true, then here's the idea. The psalmist tells us, as we've told you before, that opposition to redeem people is real. Okay, n nobody's writing anything. Now, don't call me Wednesday. Talking about you want to have a meeting. Because if you do, all I'm going to do is give you this CD. Hallelujah. This is the counseling right here. This is the counseling. Stay with me. He says, opposition against the redeemed is real. Let's take it a step further. Opposition against the redeemed is God ordained. And there's some reasons for that. 
Mark them down. One of the reasons why you and I will always have opposition no matter where we are in our redeemed lives is because God, number one, doesn't want us to become comfortable. He does not want us to become comfortable in this world because this world is not our home. This world is not our home. Secondly, opposition against the redeemed is God-ordained because God wants to keep us humble. There are some powerful things that take place in the life of redeemed people. And God wants to make sure that you and I stay humble. That's the reason why the worship principle is so important. Because if you are concentrated or concentrating on giving God the glory, it's difficult to give yourself glory. It is hard to worship yourself if you're worshiping the Lord. It's hard to talk about how great you are. It's, it, 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 is, it is difficult for me to say how bad I am, how awesome I am, if I'm continually saying to God how awesome he is. It's impossible to do it. But then the third thing is this. Opposition against or in the life of the redeemed is God-ordained because, watch, God is using us to change them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There are some people in our lives who have come along and present themselves in, oppo in opposing positions. And sometimes the Lord is doing some stuff in them that they don't even realize is going on. And so what God will do by his own mighty hand, is he will allow them to come at us. And some of them are redeemed. Some of them are other redeemed people. Or some of them are people who are going to be redeemed and don't know it. Okay, y'all ain't with me. So literally what God does is he needs a witness. He needs someone that can be his testimony to them. So rather than put the pressure on them, he'll put the pressure on you and I because he knows that we can handle it because of what he put in us. Stay with me. And then he puts us in the presence of them. Watch this. Showing them how we're going through what they're doing to us. And while they're doing to us what they're doing and we see them, when we don't see them, what's happening to us it's eating them up because they keep trying to hold us down, but in every single situation, we keep rising up, and we rise up in their presence while they're trying to hold us down. Okay, you ain't. All right, so when you get to heaven, when we get to heaven, let's go find Mrs. Job and ask her about this principle. Because it is not until you get to the end of Job's story that you see that the entire experience of Job's life was not about Job. God was after Mrs. Job. <laughs> the whole time, God is putting pressure on Job so that he can get a hold of Mrs. Job. And we know that's right because when we, we, listen, when we meet Mrs. Job, she's cussing. She said, Cur the first words out of her mouth that we know about is curse God and die. That's what she says. 
while you hold on to your integrity, curse God and die. In other words, since the Bible tells us out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, literally what's happening is she's already cursed God. She's inviting Job to come along and join with her. Job rebukes her wisely. He rebukes her, right? She slips away. And for the next 41 chapter, or 40 chapters, or I'm sorry, 39 chapters, we don't hear nothing else from Mrs. Job. Not a word. But when we get to chapter 42, here's what we find out. The whole time Job's been going through, she hasn't said anything, but she's been watching him. She's been watching him. And in chapter 42, we find out that God gets her. After all of that, he finally puts his hands on Egata. And we know that because she goes right back into the same arena that caused her to curse God in the first place. She cursed God at the loss of her ten children. Read chapter 42. She has ten more children. (laughs) She goes right back into it. Which means that she's gotten over herself. God's finally got her now. And she's willing to yield herself and go right back into the same arena that caused her pain in the first place. Sometimes God will put pressure on you because he's after someone else that's close to you. So, we have to become worshipers. That's the goal. He wants us to be worshipers. And not just in this building, y'all. And not, come on, you know, that tradition is killing us. And while, and listen, while we're following tradition, we're dying outside the building. Because our whole relationship to worship is attached to the stained glass and the pews. And I'm telling you, the devil waits until you leave here to do his thing. So that's the setting. Now, the structure of this psalm is important because what happens in this particular psalm is God uses David to lay out some stuff for us. Now, here's the issue. This psalm, as far as the structure is concerned, it's it's, it's a psalm, it's called a psalm, the superscription is a psalm of David. If you look at the superscription of the psalm, at the heading there before verse 1, it says a psalm of David. Now, in the Hebrew Bible, those words are actually a part of the text. So it would be, uh, the Psalm of David would actually, be, would actually be verse 1 in the Hebrew Bible. It has to be verse 1. It'd be, it would be um, uh, a Psalm of David, then it would be the Lord hear thee. So in other words, it's a part of the verse itself. In the English version of the scripture, what we do is make the superscription separate because what we try to do is have the superscription as some kind of identifying dynamic for the psalm. That's not the best structure. The words don't change, so it's okay. It's just it's not the best structure uh, for identifying and dealing with the psalm. All right, now, having said that, when we talk about of David, so it's a psalm of David. Is that right? Yeah. That was says, okay, a psalm of David. All right. This word translated of in the Hebrew can be also translated for. Yeah. So it's either a psalm of David or a psalm for David. The idea is this. Doesn't change it. The dynamic doesn't change much. The principle is this. Either David wrote this himself about himself or someone wrote it for him, right, in light of the battle that's to come. This particular psalm looks at the enemy and then the psalmist sits down, whoever it is, sits down and writes the psalm in light of the enemy. Now, now, now the, the context of this idea is, is that the enemy is close. It's not like, um, you know, oh my God, some, somewhere, somehow, we may be attacked. No. The chances are that the psalmist actually sees the enemy, or they at least know they're on the way. They're marching toward them at the time. So the psalmist sits down and he writes this psalm. Now, 
I am of a mind, and I, I kind of lean toward um, those uh, Old Testament um, um, historians that tell us that this psalm was not written by David, but written for David by someone who's close to the battle and close to the king. The language of the psalm kind of lends itself to that. If you look at, um, look at uh, jump down here to, uh, uh, look at verse 9, the last, last verse of the psalm, just so we can kind of move through this. Verse 9, he says, um, Save, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. See that? Now, <clears throat> the idea is, is that um, this particular verse lends itself to the idea that the psalmist is praying for their king, but they are invoking or they're requesting the presence of the real king. See, look, it's verse 9. He says, save, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. So um, um, the idea is, is that they know there's a king, but then the issue is, is that they're calling the greater king, the one who is the real ruler, who is the real ruler over all the land. The point is, is that David is a figurehead. David is the one that is seen, Right? But David himself, this is terrible, but David himself has a king. You understand what I'm saying? All right. So, so the idea is, is that this particular individual, chances are, is literally looking at the, the situation, understanding what David is in need of, and says, our king needs his king. That's the point. Our king needs his king. All right? All right. Let's look at it. Verse 1, what is he saying? Eleven times in this psalm, there is a desire and an interest that the person asks uh, the Lord to, to deal with. Hear what he says, verse 1. The Lord hear thee. Watch. Verse 1, the name of the God of Jacob, do what? Defend thee. Y'all see it? Verse 2, send help from the sanctuary. See it? That's number 3. Number 4, strengthen thee out of Zion. Everybody see it? All right. So it would be the Lord remember your offerings. That's important, y'all. And the Lord accept your burnt sacrifice. Yeah. Right? That'd be five. One, two, one, two, three, four. That's six. One, two, three, four. So that's six. Verse four. Grant thee according to your own heart. That's seven. Yeah. And fulfill all your counsel. That's eight. Everybody see it? Yeah. Watch. <clears throat> Jump down here. Verse five. Last clause. The Lord fulfill all your what? Are y'all woke? Yes, sir. Petitions, right? Okay, watch. Verse 6. Here it says, um, here's a promise. He says, the Lord saves his what? Now, if you have your own Bible, please mark those words. The Lord saves his anointed. Important. All right? Verse 6 again. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the of his right hand. All right? So then, here, literally the idea is, is that the, the, the psalmist is laying out these, um, these uh, things that he's laying out before the Lord. Structurally, what he's asking is he is invoking God to move into this situation and do some things specific for the king. All right. Now, the reason why I asked you or told you to mark down in verse, uh, verse 6, the words, the Lord saves his anointed. It is at this point that the psalm is bigger 
than the one that the person is talking about. When he says the Lord saves his anointed, everyone that is anointed can claim this verse, this statement for themselves. And beloved, you and I are the anointed of the Lord. Thank you. Listen. Right now, and I'm almost done, but I need you to grab this. Right now, where are you and I as far as God is concerned? Where are we? As far as God is concerned, where are we right now? Now you See, thank you. Someone's been around long enough to get it. Where are we? We are in Christ. New Testament, over 104 times, we are told that we are in Christ. It's important. All right, let's end this way. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to close out. Ephesians chapter 1, start at verse 3, and we're going to close out. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to start at verse 3. Everybody there? Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. If you have it, would you say amen? Amen. All right, here we go. Everybody together, go. Where are they? In heavenly places where? In Christ. If you have your own Bible or you know how to mark it down electronically, mark those words down. In Christ. Mark them down. In Christ. Now, before we go any further, let me say this to you. The language of the verse and the grammar of this particular statement is to be understood locationally. Is to be understood locationally. In other words, when the text says, in Christ, that is not a grammatical error, nor is it, again, some religious um, phenomenon. No. Locationally, we are in Christ. See this pen? pen, this marker? This is my, um, my, um, my marker for my, 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 my board, and this is one of those erasable things. You, right, so I use it for my board, right? This marker, right? Why well, I say, I take this marker, and I do this. Locationally, where's the marker? In my pocket. You got it? Locationally, now. Locationally, first, it was in my hand. But locationally, now, it's in here. When Jesus Christ saved you, what God did was take you out of your hands and put you in Christ. Watch this. So that you are no longer separate from him. Wherever I go right now, this marker is going with me. Because this marker is hidden in my pocket and wherever I go it goes the moment you're born again the moment you're saved God puts you in Jesus in such a way that no matter where he goes we're with him eternally with him with no hope or no ability rather whatsoever of ever coming out of that position you are secure forever you got it Verse 4, Ephesians 1, verse 4, go, and we're done. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Everybody together, go. All right, stop. He hath chosen us where? No, 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 where? It's in the verse. 
In him, mark those words. He chose us in him, locationally. When? Before the foundation of the world, so that God knew you before you were born. He knew you. He knew you. And of course, um, connected to that knowledge was purpose. And the idea there is he knew you, chose you in him, and then allowed you to be born because he has a purpose for you. Already has a purpose for you. So that no redeemed person ever needs to find themselves. God will do that for you. That's the reason why every redeemed person who goes way out there always finds themselves coming right back where everything started, where it all began. You can't go but so far. Because with, a, with, with, with everlasting love, God has captured you. And he holds the, the rope on his side. And he, you may go out there, but he's going to pull you right back in. Because he has purpose for you. You need not try and find. All you need to do is present your body a living sacrifice. He's going to show you. Verse 5. I'm almost done. Verse 5. All right, verse 6 and we're done. Underline the words, in the beloved. The beloved is Jesus. Now, I said all of that because I want you to go back to verse 3 and look at the words, in Christ. In Christ. You know what that word Christ is? It means anointed. The word Christ, the root of the word Christ means anointed. Meaning that you and I are in the anointed one. And everyone that's in the anointed one is anointed by virtue of your location. All right, it meant absolutely nothing to you. I went through all that. You didn't get nothing. Now, here it is, verse 6, Psalm 20, verse 6. Hear what he says. He says, Now, now know I that the Lord saves his anointed. Every last one of us can count on the delivering hand of the living God. Every last one of us.